because we believe that the Quran is a miracle because it could not it cannot be explained to come into existence from a naturalistic cause. Okay. Uh, because first of all, before reading the Quran, you need to know why why to read the Quran. So it was the first the first point of call for you would be to test the claim of Muhammad. And you take into consideration what he claimed about himself. Let me show you how I worked through that. And what helped me here was some things that C.S. Lewis taught uh, in his writings. He simply said upon him. So he's claimed an angel came to him. He, he's claiming this was revelation over 23 years given to him. Um, and this is the product. The Quran is the product of that. Um, what, what, are the, what are the options or what are the alternatives to that tr being true? Lord, liar, or lunatic? What comes to your mind when you hear that name? More importantly, who do you say that he is? Either he's crazy like the cloud was trying to imagine, you know, delusional. Maybe he's been hmm. fasting and he's hallucinating and he thought an angel spoke to him when in fact it was all in his mind. C.S. Lewis once said, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. But I accept it. I accept it on their testimony. I accept it on the testimony right. of the people around them. When you read the writings of the early church fathers, it becomes very clear that they truly believed he was God in human flesh. Well, you know, it's, it's for you. The burden's on you. You've got to provide the evidence. So we say, okay, here's one piece of the evidence. Oh, I don't accept that. The moment skeptics hear this, they immediately assume it is unreliable and go right to the analogy of the telephone game. How can the New Testament be reliable if it was preserved through word of mouth. Oh, here's the Quran. You can't have any explanation for it other than it coming from a divine. Oh, I haven't read it, but I don't accept it. So, I mean, where do you go from that, quite frankly? Yes. A couple of people will say they saw you there. Your fingerprints and DNA are there. You've made statements that implicate you before and after. And you have behaviors that people watch that seem to implicate your involvement. Well, now I have a lot more evidence. But interestingly, it's in four different categories. Some direct evidence, some forensic evidence, some physical evidence. These are the kinds of things that make a case powerful. Not just that we have lots of pieces pointing to the same uh, conclusion, but they're from, from, from such different, diverse forms. So as I was explaining, there are a multifaceted reasons to believe the uh, authorship of the Quran from a divine source. We have eight pieces that I can identify in God's crime scene. You know, you have the origin of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, two cosmological pieces. You have the uh, appearance of, of, of life in the universe and the appearance of uh, design in biology, two biological pieces of evidence. You have uh, consciousness and free age, oh, two mental pieces of, it, of, of evidence. And you also have objective moral uh, values and evil, two moral pieces of evidence. These are very different categories. You've got hard sciences, you've got philosophy there's lots of things to think about here and all those different categories point to the same there's one common causal factor that could explain all eight pieces in four very different categories it doesn't give you absolute certainty but it, is it is it unreasonable to believe things that you're convinced by because of the weight of the evidence of course not that's how we operate our whole lives but when it comes to god there's this ultra high uh, level of empiricism that people want and even when you ask them to defi define what it would be that would convince them they're not even willing to elaborate on that why should i care what, who said jesus said that oh uh it's, it's in the gospel of john okay why should i believe what john says I and mean, who is john and because here's the problem you see you you make the new testament historical that's what the christians do they think when Jesus says something in the New Testament, that actually happened in history. What the Quran does is come to correct what was corrupted. It's not a replacement for the Bible. It's not a substitute. It's a companion. Today, millions of Latter-day Saints believe the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, to be scripture. They believe it is the word of God to his children and stands as a companion to the Holy Bible. If you look at the work of Professor Raymond Farin, who wasn't even Muslim, when he looked at the structural elements of the Qur'an. But during his studies, he becomes a Muslim. People have wondered what to make of the Book of Mormon's use of chiasmus since its discovery in 1967. With a multitude of patterns within the Qur'an, if you study Raymond Farron's work, he talks about things like chiasm, parallelism, 
and concentric patterns within the Qur'an. Some have seen it as compelling evidence of the Book of Mormon's authenticity. Their sheer quantity makes it less likely that they are collectively a product of random chance. Actually, there's no, no other explanation other than th this has come from something supernatural. Readers should also consider that many of the Book of Mormon's chiasms are orderly, complex, precise, and comply well within criteria used by both LDS and non-LDS scholars. Modern academics who are not Muslims, for example, uh, uh, Professor Angela Newith, you know, you study her works. She's the foremost expert in Quranic textual studies in Germany. Okay. Um, and she says th th this is inherently one author. The Talmud describes an ideal student should be as a well-plastered cistern. And in fact, that the words of the Quran are not the same words that you find, for example, in the Hadith. Kenneth Bailey worked for years in the Middle East. Then you have many other things, for example. So if you have psychologists and analyzing the Quran because it was one author and it was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then you look at the, the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him, his wife dying and so many other things happening, his son dying and everything else. We see starting in Acts 2, the apostles start preaching and proclaiming the risen Jesus. They're threatened, they're beaten, they're thrown in prison. And in fact, we even see in Acts 7, Stephen who's killed, and in Acts 12 too, James, the son of Zebedee, is killed. What this shows the apostles weren't liars. Um, he wanted to study Islam, to write a book against Islam, to try to stop the spread of what he thought was an evil religion within his country and within Europe. I looked up and mockingly said, uh, oh, is that supposed to scare me? If you want me to believe in you, you better come down here and make me believe. I didn't know if Jesus was who he claimed to be, but I knew that it was Jesus or nothing. And there are some very simple rules that you can apply to any text to find the validity of that text. Number one, it should be free from contradictions. Number two, it should, be, it should be free from corruption and change. Okay, and it should be free from errors. The Quran is the criterion for truth. So Isn't that begging the question though, in a way? Like, you know, no. assuming or, okay. Well, I believe the Bible because it's the word of God. And if you ask them, well, why do you trust this God fellow? Then they would say, well, because he's loving and he's wise and he's all powerful. I completely trust him. And if you were to ask them why they believe that about God, they would tell you, well, I know from the Bible. Obviously, as I said, the Quran is our yardstick. Yeah. The message of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. For surely Jews seek after signs, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach a crucified Messiah. Over and over again, we will have to hear Paul's question. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Is it not true that God has ordained in his own wisdom that men will not come to know him through worldly wisdom? I firmly believe presuppositionalism flows from a consistent theology that is rooted in the Bible's teaching of the unmitigated sovereign reign of God over his creation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, it's not begging the question. Though men know the truth that God exists, they suppress that knowledge. Because if you have a criterion, everything has to be measured against that. The system recognizes the presence of sinful, rebellious presuppositions in the heart and mind of the lost. When the angels are dragging the, um, uh, the people to the hellfire, they say a very interesting thing to the people. They say, did you not use your reason? Did you not think? Did you not contemplate? Did you not sit down? Or were you basically arrogant? I, I, eat, I eat the Bible for breakfast. Yeah, I, why should I believe what it says? Why should I care what it says? Threatening me this, threatening me that. Who cares? How do you know? You don't know the people who are there. It's anonymous writers could write anything. Oh, yeah, yeah.